Now, are you dreaming to get to that 4-0 level? I bet you are. I know we've all been there. Now, if you want to get from a 3-5 to a 4-0 level, here are three lessons that you need to learn. Number one is developing a weapon. Now, this is the perfect time to develop your weapon. Now, do you have a big forehand, a nasty slice, a really good drop shot, or you just have a big serve? Whatever it is, you want to learn what your weapon is. So if you're a 3-5 level player, chances are there are one or two shots that you might prefer that you would say are your advantage. They're, they're your kind of weapon. They're something that you can rely on more often than other shots to help you win the point. Now, whatever that is, and by the way, let me know down in the comment section below what shot that is for you because I am curious. But so we want to start developing our game plan around our weapon. Now, if we have a big surf, for example, let's just say you're a big server. A lot of times, especially when you hit a big first serve, you can expect that next ball to be weaker and shorter. So as an example here, develop a weapon, but then also be ready to follow it up. So if you hit a big serve, again, chances are you're going to get something weaker or shorter that now you shouldn't wait back here for that ball to come to you. But instead, you should move forward and try to attack. So lesson number one is fine tune your weapon, really learn how to develop that and use that to your advantage and use that weapon as often as you can. A second example of that is, let's just assume you are, you have a big forehand, right? And so you wanna hit more forehands. And this time, cause I always use righties as an example, this time I'm gonna go ahead and use this example for lefties. Now let's say you have a, you're a lefty and you have a good forehand. So in this case, I always like to divide the court into thirds. And if you have a bigger forehand, you really wanna try and hit as many forehands as possible. So in this case, anything that's on your forehand side should obviously be a forehand. And by the way, if you're righty, it's just the opposite way around. Anything in the middle or even slightly on your backhand side, you want to hit a forehand. And only everything that's really far in that backhand corner, you want to hit a backhand. Now you might ask, well, why would I try and run around my backhand if I can just hit a backhand? Well, if your forehand is your better shot, and if your forehand is gonna increase the chance of you winning the point, well, why not do that? Every strategy and every lesson that I will ever try to teach you is designed to help you increase the chance of you winning the point. And by using our stronger shot, meaning in this case, our forehand more often, we are more likely to win that point because we increase the chance of us winning the point. But that brings us into lesson number two. Now, lesson number two is about attacking the net. And this strategy is so effective at the 3-0, 3-5, and 4-0 level because it puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. I'm gonna get to that in just a moment, but when you attack the net, it's so effective. So a big bonus takeaway from this is actually practice your volleys more. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and saying that volleys are probably some of the less practiced shots in your game. But if you become comfortable with the net and if you practice your volleys a whole lot more, I guarantee you, not only is this strategy going to be a whole lot more effective, but you are going to win more points in your matches. So when you come to the net, three main things happen. Number one, you simply put pressure on your opponent. And when you put pressure on your opponent, let's say you come to the net and they all of a sudden have to hit a tougher shot. So when you put pressure on them, they might have to either try to go for that passing shot down line or that sharp angle cross court or that lob. Either way, all of those options are tougher shots. So by putting pressure on them, you force them to try and hit tougher shot, which is a lot more likely to either make them miss or hit something shorter and weaker that you can now attack. So when you put pressure on them, you want to make them miss ideally. Best case scenario is you come to the net, you don't even have to hit a volley, but just by you come to the net and putting pressure on your opponent, they freak out and they miss. The second thing that happens when you come to the net is you rush them because now you all of a sudden you're taking balls sooner and that means you're gonna rush them on their preparation, their footwork, their decision making. Everything about that next shot that they have to hit is gonna become more rushed. And when you're rushed, the quality of shots that they can hit goes down. So which means if you rush them, they're again, A, more likely to miss, or B, they're likely to hit, get, uh, give you something shorter or weaker that you can now punish and attack. And the third thing that happens when you come to the net is it simply becomes easier for you to finish those weaker shots. 
So when you wait further back in the chord, a few things occur. Number one, the, the longer you wait to make contact with the ball, the more time you give your opponent to get back in a position where they can defend their court. So when you move in, not only is it easier to hit through your opponent, not only do you get more angles, but just in general, it becomes a lot easier to finish the point with an aggressive shot because shots become easier, it becomes easier to hit through your opponent, you got more options. So overall, it's just a much better play if you try and finish balls from up here rather than from back here. So by coming to the net, it's not just a very effective strategy, but it's also a great way to force more mistakes and force weaker shots from your opponent. But I have one great strategy left for you, and that is this one. But before I reveal strategy number three, make sure to smash like and subscribe and check out some of the other videos on my channel that are gonna help you level up your game. Lesson number three is about forcing mistakes. Now what that means is this, a point in tennis can end in one out of three ways. You can either hit a winner, you can force an error from your opponent, or your opponent commit, can commit an unforced error. But so we don't wanna rely on those unforced errors because they're easy mistakes that your opponent commits and we can't always count on that because sometimes they might not make any mistakes or sometimes they just might commit a few, but they're more random that we don't wanna count on. And a winner is just a perfect outcome of us trying to force a mistake. Now, Craig O'Shaughnessy probably said it best. And according to him, there are eight ways you can force a mistake. Height, depth, direction, um, speed, spin, consistency, court positioning, and time. So just to, I mean, they're pretty self-explanatory, at least most of them, but think about height as an example. Now, if that ball's super high or super low, those shots become much tougher. And those, anytime that ball becomes tougher, or anytime we make our opponent's life tougher, they're a lot more likely to miss or hit something shorter and weaker that we can attack. So we wanna think about really how to make our opponent as uncomfortable as possible so that they either miss or hit a shorter, weaker shot that we can attack. So we wanna think about one out of those eight ways, or maybe several out of those eight ways, in how to force mistakes from our opponent. And ideally, we combine that with our weapon and their weakness. So think about this way. When Nadal plays Federer, what is the first thing that comes to your mind in terms of what Nadal wants to do? Well, if you've ever watched them play, what Nadal loves to do is he loves to hit that high topspin forehand to Federer's back. And eventually, Federer kind of starts cheating it kind of stays a little bit in, in that backhand corner because he doesn't want to hit that many backhands because he's hoping that eventually he can run around and hit a forehand. However, if Nadal really makes that shot really, really tough for Federer, sometimes Federer will leave that ball kind of either floating down the line or, or down the middle, and now Nadal can run around and hit into the open court with his forehand inside out. Now, that is a prime example of us trying to force a mistake or force a weaker shot. And so in this case, what Nadal uses, he uses height because that ball jumps up very high on that back end. He uses spin because spin is tough to deal with. He also uses, in this case, direction to kind of get, uh, get Federer moving off the court. Um, but what else does he use? Sometimes, especially when that ball is deep, he might use depth to make it even tougher for Federer to get a good play on his back end. So as you can see, you know, I mean, Nadal is using four elements in one shot because when you combine those elements to try and make your opponent's life tougher and force more mistakes that's when that becomes a lot more effective and the higher you go in level the more subtle and the more nuanced those weaknesses are and the harder they are to exploit but that's why you can't just rely on easy mistakes by let's say just being consistent um, and that, that's like for example in the video that I made on how to become a 3-0 level player from a 2-5 level player you know, a lot of that is just being more consistent and getting more shots in play. At the higher level, that doesn't work anymore. You have to think about how you can do damage to your opponent. And thinking about how to force an error by making it tougher using one of those eight ways, that's a great way to do that. So I want you to think about how to make it tougher for your opponent to return a shot that's gonna make them more likely to miss or give you something weaker. Now, the two elements that didn't really explain so far though, or court positioning and time. So starting with time, a simple example would be is, let's say, okay, let's say you're coming to the net and you're you're taking that ball early in the court, or just an even easier example. Let's say you hit that ball off the court, your opponent is, is hitting that shot back, and instead of waiting for that ball to come to you back here, you're actually taking that ball earlier in the court 
And now what you've done is you've taken time away from your opponent, which means they didn't even have a chance to recover into a good spot, but they're basically here when you're making contact. So they, you take time away from their setup, their decision making, and their recovery. So now they're less able to defend their court and you're gonna rush them on the next shot if they get there. So that would be time. Now court positioning on the other hand, that can be two simple examples here. Number one, let's say you're a, you stay really close to that baseline and I just did a video on Emma Raducanu and as an aggressive baseline, what she likes to do is she likes to stay along that baseline and what that does is it allows you to be more aggressive but it also means you're constantly taking time away from your opponent because you're taking that ball sooner. So this would be an example of court positioning, how your court positioning affects your opponent. Another example of this would be, let's say you are coming to the net and now you're putting more pressure on your opponent, which means they are more likely to miss or hit something weaker or shorter that you can attack. So these are two, ex these are two examples of court positioning, but if you combine all those eight ways, and I'm not saying you have to combine all of those eight ways in a single shot or even a single rally, but as you saw, one shot can have several of those elements, um, or one rally can technically have all eight of those elements, but you want to start thinking about how to force mistakes and how to make your opponent more likely to miss or hit something weak or shorter that you can attack. Now, if you learn those three lessons, I have no doubt that you're going to get from a 3-5 to that 4 or level. Now, before you leave, check out this video to get a massive upgrade to your forehand and to turn your forehand into a weapon, or click this video for more great strategies to help you win more points in your next match.